and this is our second lecture revolving around mitral regurgitation. In this lecture here, we'll explore clinical presentations we might see if someone has mitral regurgitation, some of the symptoms they might present with and some of the referral reasons we might see. Then we'll start to address some of the common mechanisms that we actually see that are driving force behind the mitral regurgitation, such as annular dilatation, myocardial infarction, rheumatic heart disease, prolapse and flail. Then finally, we'll look at the Carpentier scoring method for different types of regurgitation. Basically, mitral regurgitation is typically termed as a pansystolic or holosystolic murmur, best heard at the apex. It leads into and obscures the second heart sound, S2. It has a flat intensity with a blowing type sound. It's termed pansystolic because as soon as the LV starts to generate pressure, the valve leaks, as the left atrium is a relatively low pressure environment. When the mitral regurgitation is significant, the third heart sound becomes more prominent. Patients present with shortness of breath, pulmonary edema, orthopnea, which is a problem of actually lying down, palpitations, uh, in particular atrial fibrillation, right heart failure, peripheral edema, lethargy and dizziness. Symptoms can vary depending on the presentation of the MR. If it's acute, such as mitral valve chordae rupture, the LA does not have a chance to become compliant and accept the increased volume from the regurgitation. Symptoms are significant and come on with short onset. In chronic mitral regurgitation, the patient may develop the symptoms slowly over the time with increasing severity. This is more likely seen with mitral valve prolapse. A mild or moderate amount of regurgitation may occur and the heart remodels accordingly to accommodate this. Secondary findings that we see are left atrial dilatation, left ventricular dilatation, increased pulmonary vein pressures, right ventricular dilatation, right ventricular hypertrophy, right ventricular dysfunction, a raised JVP or jugular venous pressure, or peripheral edema. In many normal mitral valves, we actually see a little bit of mitral regurgitation. The leak happens as a physiological function of the valve closing. As with uh, closing a door with someone standing on the other side, they will feel some air motion associated with the door closing, air moving through the door frame towards the person. Typically, it's associated with an uh, aging process where we see sclerosis and fibrosis of the leaflets. This is the body resolving the constant scarring repair uh, of the leaflets, which leads to calcification. The calcification can limit the leaflet's ability to co-apt uniformly and thus leads to regurgitation. This is usually benign with trivial to mild regurgitation observed and the direction of the jet is usually central. Annular dilatation severely contributes to regurgitation. Consider the door frame getting larger, but the door staying the same size. This may result from left ventricular dilatation or left atrial dilatation. It can be a case of the chicken or the egg. Did the mitral regurgitation create the chamber dilatation, or did the chamber dilatation lead to the mitral regurgitation? The process, however, can actually spiral. Increasing mitral regurgitation leads to further cavity dilatation that in turn leads to increasing mitral regurgitation. A typical corrective procedure is an annuloplasty ring. The ring may be metal or plastic with fabric kind of uh, covering over the top and it may be flexible or rigid. The goal of the ring insertion is to increase leaflet coarmentation while preserving the annular shape and motion. Left ventricular dilatation can also lead to tethering of the valve leaflets. As the cavity enlarges, the further the subvalvular port structures move away from the valve, the more difficult it is for the leaflets to actually coapt at the annular level. In our example here, we can actually see an example of an annular ring. And if we were to look at it side on, we'd actually see that it's a little bit saddle shaped to accommodate the annular shape. And through the ultrasound here, we can actually see it very clearly in its seated position. Myocardial infarction can indirectly lead to mitral regurgitation. In response to myocardial damage, 
cardiac remodeling, which is an unwanted effect, may occur. This in turn can lead to the LV changing shape. In doing so, a wall which holds the papillary muscle and the support structure to the mitral valve may move distantly away from the valve. The mitral regurgitation is rarely directed centrally. One of the leaflets is effectively tethered as part of this process. The wall has moved, pulling the papillary muscle and the cordae along with it. And unfortunately, the cordae cannot elongate to accommodate for this process. In a case with an inferior infarct, which would involve the posterior leaflet, the anterior leaflet comes to coapt at the leaflet point at the annulus, but does not meet the posterior leaflet because it is tethered, held more into the ventricle. This means the anterior leaflet overrides the posterior leaflet, and this creates a posteriorly directed mitral regurgitant jet. Similar in effect when we have an MI that affects the pupillary muscle itself. It might calcify and retract, and therefore lead to MR in a very much similar process. And in this example here, we've got dilatation associated with an infarct that's affecting the anterolateral wall here. So normally we'd have our ventricle come pretty much straight up, but it's expanded and coming out. And in doing so, the pupillary muscle has retracted with that part, and we can see the cordae there to tethering the valve, preventing it from actually closing, and as a result, we've got a very much eccentric directed mitral regurgitation. <clears throat> Rheumatic mitral disease is caused as MR in a very similar overriding type manner. The leaflet commissures become sclerosed and calcific. Then fusion occurs along the commissures, arising from the bases, moving towards the middle working a bit like a zipper. This leads to the posterior leaflet being reduced in mobility and in some instances immobile. And this is because the posterior leaflet actually covers more of the annulus but its length is much shorter than the anterior leaflet. In systole, the anterior leaflet therefore overrides the posterior leaflet because it is no longer there to actually meet and this results in again posteriorly directed mitral regurgitation. Rheumatic disease, furthermore, has subvalvular effects. It calcifies and shortens the cordae tendine. This may lead to tethering of the leaflets and prevent them from coapting effectively. And here we have an example of a rheumatic mitral valve. So we can see the cordae are very thick, they're kind of rope like in their appearance. The leaflets of the um, mitral valve here, we have the anterior leaflet overriding the posterior one. The posterior one is retracted and held in place by the cordae. So it overrides the posterior leaflet, and therefore we can see this eccentric, posteriorly directed mitral regurgitation. In the case of a hyperdynamic left ventricle or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with obstruction, we may also see mitral regurgitation. The Venturi effect of blood moving quickly through the LV or the LVOT may draw cordae of the mitral valve upwards, effectively tugging the leaflet upwards and preventing strong leaflet coaptation. As a result of this action, typically we get a posteriorly directed mitral regurgitant jet. The severity of mitral regurgitation is increased with exercise performing the valve salve manoeuvre, post ectopic beats, and after giving GTN. Congenital malformations are relatively rare. They may occur in isolation or with other malformations. Atrioventricular defects often lead to mitral regurgitation due to malformation of the endocardial cushions. Septum primum defects are also associated with these. Cleft mitral valves have the vision down one of the leaflets, so it actually appears tri-leaflet when viewed from a short axis window. A parachute mitral valve may have a single papillary muscle and demonstrate marked redundancy in the leaflet. And double outlet mitral valves are exceptionally rare. An example in slides to come show an example of this nicely in a short axis. It is important to note that mitral valve clips may be deployed as a repair mechanism. 
as the leaflets are clipped in the middle, the mid portions of the anterior leaflet and the posterior leaflet, repair effectively makes a double outlet orifice. And in this example here, we have someone with a hokum, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. We can see significant increased thickness in the LV walls. So we have a small cavity size, and in the small cavity size, the LV has to be vigorous to actually maintain a good cardiac output. So the heart is actually squeezing hard, and in doing so, the chordae are being sucked up into the LVOT, and we can see this flow acceleration through the LVOT and into the aortic valve. So as part of that process, the cord are getting sucked up, the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve lifts up, and then we get this posteriorly directed mitral regurgitation. In our example on the left here, we have a parachute mitral valve. So we can see all this redundant tissue associated with the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve. And then the image on the right here, we've got a double orifice. So there's two circles associated with the valve. Infective endocarditis can be devastating to a valve. Vegetation forms, which are effectively infective blood clots around sites of activity. The infection can lead to leaflet perforation and mitral regurgitation occurring through the body of the leaflet rather than at the leaflet tips. Vegetations tend to be mobile and can get in the way of the leaflets forming good coaptation, and therefore we see regurgitation also. Abscesses may form around the annulus, which may disrupt the support of the leaflets, which then in turn leads to mitral regurgitation. The abscess may also rupture, typically first on the ventricular side in the high pressure, and then because it's relatively weak, it may then rupture on the atrial side, leading to free-flowing mitral regurgitation. A ruptured abscess may also have further effect for the mitral valve leaflet support. Loflo endocarditis, also called non-infective endocarditis, is typically seen in things such as hyperinosinic syndrome, eosinophilic leukemia, carcinoma, lymphomas, some certain drug reactions, or a reaction to parasites. And this example here of our parasternal long axis left ventricle we can see the mitral valve coapting and then this long structure that we see here. And we know this definitely wouldn't be a myxoma or a papillary fibrolistoma because of its actual position and how it actually lays with the mitral valve. So myxoma arises from the atrial septum and papillary fibrolistomas typically form on the ventricular side of the valve. Myxomatous disease is a common cause of mitral regurgitation. In most cases, it is idiopathic. Although there are autosomal dominant traits, and in rarer cases, recessive genetic factors. Basically, the fibrous collagen layer in the leaflet thins and is replaced by mucoid materials. The valve leaflets enlarge and become more rubbery and floppy. And also the chordae tendae thin and elongate. The result is that the leaflets bow back in systole. There is greater leaflet surface area and the chordae are longer. This disease progresses and the bowing of the leaflet leads to prolapse, where the coaptation point moves beyond the level of the annulus. And in one of the three portions of the anterior or posterior leaflet may be involved, or multiple portions may be involved. It's important to note that the leaflet tips point backward into the ventricle. And this is because the valve is still tethered completely by the chordae. Both leaflets may be affected equally, or it may be observed that the anterior posterior leaflet demonstrates it more, uh, more prominently. And here we have an example of prolapse associated with the mitral valve. So parasternal long axis shot of the left ventricle, if we were to draw a line across the annulus, it would run through here. And so we can see that particularly the posterior leaflet bows uh, past the annulus. And so at a significant point, we call this now prolapse.
Flail is a common cause of acute significant mitral regurgitation. The chordae and the support structures of the mitral valve, whether they be the primary, secondary, strut, or commissure, uh, can rupture as a result of vegetations or myxomatous disease, left ventricular dilatation, cardiac remodeling, or a papillary muscle infarct. Typically, the most common chordae are the primary chordae that extend from the middle scallop of the posterior leaflet or the mid portion of the anterior leaflet. This is because the chordae here are the longest and take the most tension associated with the valve closing. In flail, the leaflet tip will point towards the left atrium, and this is because the leaflet has a lost its support structure. Prolapse of the affected leaflet portion is often observed in most instances. The resulting mitral regurgitant jet is different to prolapse. The MI jet is very eccentric and usually moderately severe or more. Additionally, if you happen to look at the regurgitation in a short axis view, you typically see this splaying effect of colour that smears right across the annulus. It looks very unusual and that's a typical thing of a very eccentric jet moving through the valve. Here we have a transesophageal view of our mitral valve, and we can see our flail segment. So it's definitely flail because no longer is the leaflet tip pointing back towards the ventricle, it's now pointing into the left atrium. And as a result there, we've got this very eccentric mitral regurgitant jet that hugs the wall and then moves around the atrium. It is important to note there are other things that can lead to mitral regurgitation. Things such as radiation therapy or chemotherapy, where the leaflets may become sclerosed and retract and therefore lead to mitral regurgitation. There are certain medications that are known to cause mitral regurgitation. Fenfluramin, fentermin, or what used to be called fenfen, or other medications that contain ergotamine. Trauma may also lead to MR, either through direct impact or the sudden shearing motion associated with severe jolt to the body. Increased afterload will also lead to mitral regurgitation, as the LV has to work harder against hypertension or aortic stenosis, the blood will move through the pass of least resistance, and the severity of mitral regurgitation will therefore increase with someone that has a high afterload. Therefore, it is very important that we take BPs routinely with our scans. The mitral regurgitation may look less severe when we have a routine evaluation of the patient, just simply because the blood pressure has been more controlled and is lower at this point in time. Now we'll actually assess the Carpentier's functional classification model. Basically, we see the various types listed here. In type 1, we have normal leaflet motion. The MR may be a result of annular dilatation, leaflet perforation or calcification, vegetations, which uh, basically prevent adequate leaflet coaptation. Type 2 is associated with excessive leaflet motion, typically what we see with myxomatous disease, prolapse, and flail. In type 3, we have restricted leaflet motion. This is then further broken down into type A and type B. Type 3A is a restricted opening that may result from radio or chemotherapy or rheumatic heart disease. In these instances, the valve may not be able to open properly and also fail to coab securely. In type 3b, uh, this is typically associated with cardiac remodeling, LV dilatation, and LV infarction. An LV wall infarct at an area near the pupillary muscle may lead to an expansion of the affected walls, effectively pulling the pupillary muscle and cordae away from the valve. As the cordae have relatively fixed length, the valve can no longer close properly. Then we actually come to looking to repair or replace valves. We look to repair valves depending on the probability of success. In high success rates, typically we see a valve that has a small perforation that could be created from trauma or vegetation 
a posterior leaflet middle scallop prolapse with or without flail. This is typically corrected also with a quadrilateral resection where the middle scallop of the posterior leaflet is excised away and then the medial and lateral scallops are sutured together. When viewed from a parasternal short axis window, there's a bright focal point in the mid portion of the posterior leaflet which in, uh, identifies the suture point. An annular plasty ring is often also inserted to aid with support in uh, the mitral valve. Neocordae may be sewn in at the pepperoni muscle and the leaflet tips. There may be one or multiples of these supporting the structures. Typically we see moderate success when there are multiple segments prolapsing, and so therefore it is more difficult to repair the valve. As there is much subvalvular disease that may be associated with a rheumatic heart, the probability of a successful repair is reduced. Then we have our cases that have a low success rate for repair. In the presence of ischemic heart disease, there can often be very little that uh, can assist the patient with cardiac remodeling and therefore ways to reduce the mitral regurgitation severity. When the prolapse involves both leaflets, there is reduced success rates. This can be attributed if we actually have the posterior leaflet resection restricting that leaflet, the anterior leaflet will fail to coapt with it because it now fails to meet at the annular level, so we get increased mobility of the anterior leaflet and then the posteriorly directed mitral regurgitation. Calcification can make the sewing of the annular plasty ring very difficult as uh, the calcification is very difficult to sew into and there may be not enough tissue to actually hold the ring uh, appropriately. And finally here we have an example of the mitral valve clip. So we can see one here that's actually deployed off a catheter wire. And here we have a 3D ultrasound and mitral valve and the clip actually placed in situ. In summary, mitral regurgitation comes in a variety of forms and may present in acute or chronic cases. A skilled sonographer will always pan through the valve to identify the origin of the direction of the jet and thus understand the etiology and mechanism behind the flow that's being observed. Functional regurgitation may be broken down into four types. This may assist a surgeon with this approach when it comes to patient management. There are a number of factors to consider when to proceed with the repair or replacement. We have discussed echo findings. However, there are also factors such as the patient's ability to tolerate anticoagulants and the ability to tolerate major cardiac surgery and life expectancy that are thrown into the mix there when the surgeon makes their decision.